Okay. Good morning. Thanks for coming. I want to thank the organizers uh, for a very interesting workshop. Unfortunately, I have to leave uh, shortly after my talk to the airport. Um, Tom told me earlier this week that the term explicit is better than the term deterministic to explain what we're doing. So the topic is an explicit rateless code for BSC. This is joint work with Benny Appelboim and uh, Liron David. They're both from my department. Liron is a student. Um, we're considering the case where you have an encoder and in a decoder. They are speaking over a binary symmetric channel where P is uh, any number between 0 and 1 half. We don't uh, have any assumptions of, uh, about P being bounded away from 1 half, but we do require that P is constant. The situation is the situation in which the encoder does not know the crossover probability P. So what can it do? Um, for messages of length k, what the encoder has to do, it has to generate an infinite sequence. In our case, these are bits. Uh, and um, the decoder will receive these noisy bits and uh, it will try to decode. Uh, we use a definition of uh, the following definition of achieving capacity. Uh, we want for every p and for every uh, constant gap to capacity. If you have the right length, means that the difference between the uh, capacity of the channel and the rate of the code is delta, then uh, the probability over the channel, and only the channel, because everything here is deterministic, that the decoder will uh, uh, find y tends to 0, doesn't find y, sorry, tends to 0 as uh, k tends to infinity. So this is uh, the definition we use for uh, achieving capacity. Uh, previous work, which is related to rateless codes. So of course, the topic was introduced by Mike, and he suggested these LT codes for the erasure channel. And it was later uh, improved in the running time by Amin Chocolai. For the Gaussian channel, there's the work of uh, Uri Erez, Trot, and uh, Vornel. And for the BSC channel, there's a work from uh, a bunch of fellows from MIT, the, the, I don't remember all the names, Perry, Balakrishnan, Shah, I don't remember all the names, sorry. Um, now, all these constructions are characterized by uh, the fact that they are probabilistic. What do I mean by that? I mean that they build in an ensemble of codes, and they show that if you pick a, a code randomly from it, then you get nice properties. That would mean that when I look here at the probability, the probability depends not only on the channel, but also on the choice of the code from the ensemble. Okay. We're interested um, in one specific code. Why? Well, because from a theoretical point of view, if the encoder and decoder have to pick a code from the ensemble, that means that they have to share some randomness. That means that there is some error-free side channel. And uh, from a theoretical point of view, we wanted to avoid that assumption. Three other features of our uh, construction. First of all, it's systematic. It means that the first uh, k bits are simply the bits of x. Uh, the construction is computationally efficient, asymptotically. Uh, what it means is that it's roughly constant time per bit of the code. And uh, you can do all the computations in parallel with uh, logarithmic depth uh, circuits. It means that, in theory, you could get high throughput. Um, the decoding error probability. So how fast does this error tend to 0? Uh, it tends almost exponentially fast. There, we have here a function which tends to infinity, but it could be arbitrarily slow. So uh, it's almost exponential. And if you fix k and you forget about capacity, you just want to reach a very uh, low error, then as n tends to infinity, the decoding error decreases in this uh, fashion. OK, any questions? OK, now the first uh, method that we use is uh, concatenated codes. Uh, I was talking to Oni Roth about this, and he said, yes, of course, Concatenated codes are the remedy for all your problems in life. 
Uh, so let me just say one word what the concatenate codes are for the sake of the people who uh, are not confident with this definition. And then I'll tell you why we love them. So um, what you do in a concatenated code, you have two codes. You have an outer code and an inner code. You take your uh, information, x, and then you apply your outer code. You get a, a longer word, y, y of out. And then you take this longer word, you divide it into sub-blocks, and you apply in parallel to each of the sub-blocks an inner code. And then you get your final code word. So you, the rate is the product of the rates of the codes. And the reason that uh, we love concatenated codes is that if these blocks are short, let's say that they are a uh, logarithmic length, then we have no problem to apply, say, even maximum likelihood decoding because we can afford exponential in log n time. That will be polynomial. Okay? So that's one feature that we like. Another feature that we like is that from the point of view of the outer code, the channel is much better than the original channel. So you get this simplification of, uh, of uh, the yeah, decoding success. And the third property that we like, that we don't use in our construction, but uh, is often used, instead of uh, having to pick a code randomly from an ensemble, what you could do is you could use all the code words, all the uh, codes from the ensemble, uh, knowing that most of the codes in the ensemble are great, and then you don't have an ensemble anymore. Then it becomes a deterministic construction. So these are uh, the benefits of the uh, concatenated codes. I don't want to elaborate a lot on the outer code that we use. Let me just say a few words about it. The outer code that we use is a code by Guru Swami in Indic. Uh, it has a rate which uh, tends to 1. The, the rate depends there on the uh, size of the alphabet. And the, it's a really great code. Uh, it's almost linear time, decodable and encodable. And the uh, it's in like almost MDS type of code because the number of errors that it can tolerate is linear in the redundancy. So if you add R bits, if the difference between N and K is R, then they can handle some constant fraction of R in the number of errors. So it's a really useful code for our purposes. Uh, so let me just focus on the inner code. So what I want to show... Guy, is the outer code rateless? It's not a fixed outer code. Yeah. So why not just use an MDS code? Because then you won't get linear time um, decoding and encoding. Okay. Okay, so what do we need from our uh, inner code? <coughs> what we're looking for, so now I'm focusing on the inner code and I'm not going to elaborate anymore on the outer code or uh, on the concatenation. This is kind of standout. So what we need is uh, we, we want to construct a uh, generating matrix. It will start with uh, the identity matrix. This will be the first k rows. And then we want to generate the next row and the one after that and continue in this fashion in an infinite sequence. This will be our generating matrix. So it has k columns. And uh, the goal is, um, after you have computed the first n minus 1 rows, how do you compute the next row? This is uh, the problem. Uh, it's one fixed matrix that we're interested in, given k. The, and so of course, the encoding is simply multiplication by the, you take the matrix and you multiply it by the information <laughs> word. Decoding. It's simply maximum likelihood decoding. Namely, you're given, you're given your noisy code word, and you look for the closest uh, code word in your code. And um, let's focus now on how to compute this fellow, how to compute the next row. That's, uh, so, Guy, is your k really log n, then? Is that the way to think about it? k? No, k tends to infinity. It's, uh, 
But is it in this <coughs> instruction only? Oh, yes, 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 yes. This will be actually, let's say that this is k. Sometimes it's this. Better use the following notation. I'll call, I'll call this k in. And here I'll use log of k, sorry. So this is the length of the information word. And uh, the inner code will have block lengths, which are logarithmic in the. Uh, here you can afford to run in exponential time. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly good. OK. So uh, we, we uh, plan to use maximum likelihood decoding. So what I need to tell you is a sufficient condition for maximum likelihood to succeed. And then what we want to do is we want to build a code, a generating matrix, which satisfies this sufficient condition. OK. So everybody knows that random codes are, uh, are good codes. So what property of random codes can be focused at and can explain why maximum likelihood decoding is successful? So the sufficient condition, it's also necessary, but we're only concerned here with the sufficient condition. For ML success, the sufficient condition is that you have what is called an average spectrum. Okay. This is the term. What this condition says is that you look at the weight distribution of a random code. So suppose I were to pick the rows of this matrix at random, uniformly at random and independently. Then I would get this random code. And I could ask, uh, how many code words do I have of, of weight i? But let's uh, denote this by w star i n. This is the expected number. Expected number of code words of weight i. Actually, I'm not going to be uh, looking at the code words. I'm going to look at the information words, which are mapped to code words of, of uh, weight i. It's the same thing. You'll see later why I'm interested in the information words and not in the. OK, now it's easy to see that this number is uh, 2 to the k minus 1 times n choose i times 2 to the n. Just to be concrete, there's. Easy, it's easy to calculate for i greater than uh, 0, of course. And now uh, there is a theorem. Um, I, uh, I'm quite sure that this theorem is, everybody who's an expert in the field knows about it. It took, it took us some time to find the reference for it. The reference we could find is a theorem by Poltirev. From 94, I believe. And what the theorem says, that if you take any linear code uh, and you look at the weight distribution of this linear code, and if uh, win is very close to w star in, in the following sense, so first they want the minimum distance to be the right minimum distance. So you want this to be 0. If i is less than this uh, delta of Gilbert Varshamov times n, this is, a, this is a parameter which depends on the rate of the code. And um, here you have 2 to the little o of n times w star i n otherwise for the high, higher i's. OK? So what Poltirev tells us is that if you take a, a linear code whose uh, weight distribution satisfies two properties, first of all, you have a minimum distance which is what you expect to get in a random code. And secondly, the, the weights, the number of code words you have on, of each weight, is similar to the number that you have in a random code, then maximum likelihood uh, decoding is, is uh, successful. OK, then W star is supposed to be divided by 2. I'm counting. I'm not uh, asking what is the proportion of the fellows. More than 2 to the end, right? Yep. The mistake, minus 2 to the n. Minus k. 
to the minus this. Yeah. Did get it right? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'd be a strange. Okay. Uh, Good. So Poltirev gives us uh, this condition, uh, which we would like to uh, mimic. It actually tells us that um, that the uh, let me be even more specific that the uh, probability of decoding failure of ML decoding failure this probability will be bounded by the probability over the random code ML decoding. Uh, with a star for the random code, times 2 to the little o of n. And since this decreases exponentially, this fellow is not very interesting. OK? Good. So now what we want to do is we want to mimic We want to mimic this uh, theory. We can't use it as is. We're not uh, able to find a code which uh, has such a large minimum distance. So what we are going to do is we're going to uh, devise an exponential time algorithm that is given the first n minus rows, n minus 1 rows, and computes the next row, the rnth row. And what it will satisfy, it will have win, which will satisfy the following. It will be 0 if i is less than some uh, n over log n. Uh, I could be more specific here, but uh, I don't want to uh, bug you. And here it will be w star i n times 2 to the little o of n if uh, i is greater than this uh, threshold. And we also add here some polynomial in n. <coughs> so this is uh, the code I will, uh, the, the um, weight distribution of the code I plan to construct. And uh, what we do is we extend the proof of uh, Pol Poltirev's theorem to show that under uh, this weight distribution, the probability of decoding failure is bounded by 2 to the minus n over log n. So what makes the, uh, what influences here the exponent is the minimum distance. OK, no big surprise. Good. So now uh, uh, let me tell you how we uh, construct such a code. Okay. So if you have a code which satisfies this uh, weight distribution, ML decoding will be good enough for us. OK. so. Um, At, um, let's look at how, how this thing uh, evolves. This is a random process, and let's see how this thing evolves. So if I have um, w star of i n minus 1 and w star of i plus 1 n minus 1, and now I'm adding another row randomly, what happens to these uh, two quantities? Well, half the fellows are going to stay with the same weight because they are uh, orthogonal to the row you add. And half the fellows will uh, not be orthogonal to the row you add, and therefore their weight will increase. And uh, here, again, one half will stay with the same weight, and one half will have an additional one in their weight. OK? So what you could see is that you have this recurrence, which tells you that w star i n equals 1 half of w star i minus 1 n minus 1 plus w star i and n minus 1. And this, if we're able to uh, mimic this recurrence, then we will be uh, able to achieve this part. 
Okay? Good. So, um, how do we do that? Uh, so, here what we do is we uh, construct, it's easier to look at it as a game of uh, balls and bins. So, uh, a ball. A ball is an information word, and it falls into a bin, which is indexed by the weight of the code word that corresponds to that information word. Okay? So you have your bins, and you have here the uh, number of balls in each bin. Good. So if I have here uh, some weight i, the height of this thing will be my wi, let's say n minus 1. Now I want to add another row. What do I do? So I'm looking for a row that will kind of split this thing into half. Half of it will increase its weight, and the other half will remain in the same place. This is what I'm trying to do. OK. So <clears throat> suppose I fix a vector x, and I pick r. This is my row that I want to add uniformly at random from this uh, as a k vector, a k bit vector. And I look at the random variable, which is, let's call it z of x, which is simply the product of r, r and x. <laughs> then I know that this uh, random variable is a one half Bernoulli random variable. So, uh, and this is what we saw over here, right? That it goes one half to here, one half to here. So this is good. But what uh, you should notice is that these random variables over the different x's are not independent. Because of uh, linear dependencies, they will not be independent. So uh, we can't apply a Chernoff bound or anything of that sort. <coughs> On the other hand, if you look at these random variables zx, <coughs> then they are uh, pairwise independent. Since they are pairwise independent, because if you have two x's which are different, uh, the corresponding random variables zx and zx2 will be independent. So if, if they're pairwise independent, then you can apply Chebyshev's inequality. Okay? What does Chebyshev inequality give us in, in, this, uh, in this situation? It tells us that if I have some arbitrary set w of code words, of information words, sorry, this w is a subset w is a subset of 0, 1 to the k. And if I tell you that this w is not too small, let's say at least 2 times n squared, then what I can show using Chebyshev's inequality is that 1 minus 1 over 2n fraction of the uh, r's are good in the, in the sense that they take w and kind of split it into 1 third, 2 third parts. So I'm, this is my situation. I have here my w. And I say that I split it into 1 third, 2 third. If this part is uh, between 1 third and 2 thirds of w, and so is this part. OK? So I'm not, I'm not dividing it exactly by half. It suffices to divide it into 1 third, 2 thirds. Yeah. So for occupancy models, it's uh, sort of a classical approach to try for sonization or some other sort of transform that will allow you to treat the occupancies as independent random variables and then <coughs> come back through an inverse transform. Yeah, these are techniques to, to approximate the uh, uh, binomial, binomial. Uh, yeah, they, they have other applications as yeah. well. Basically, Poissonization would allow you to treat the random variables as in, independent because you only have a constraint on the total occupancy. I think that that would work with probability. Namely, I, was all, I, would, I might always have these leftovers which I uh, could not get rid of. This is what I suspect happened. If you apply it for sonization and inverse for sonization, it's exact. If you look I, have to I have to check that. We can, we can talk about okay. But this seems to work, and he only needs it. He's getting the deterministic out of it, so. Yeah, yeah. the whole. It's simple. It's simple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, the problem I have here. So let's see what do I get. I get here that I can simultaneously, one third, two thirds, split all the bins which are sufficiently large. B 
because uh, such a huge fraction of the fellows are good, so by union bound, at least one half of the R's are good. Okay. What about the small fellows? Right. So this is the part where uh, we have to do some uh, kind of uh, tweaking. So what we do is we mark balls. Okay. So M will be the set of marked balls. Whenever uh, an information word, a ball, belongs to a bin which is small, the small meaning that its size is less than this threshold, we mark it. And then it remains marked forever. Okay, so you have here the balls, and you also have these uh, marked balls, which are spread. Maybe here there are some marked balls. I don't care that now they're in a big bin. They're still marked. Okay? And now when I'm looking at the size of a bin, I'm looking only at the unmarked balls in the bin, and I apply this method. So I only have this problem with the marked balls. So what I do is I take the leftmost bin, which has a marked ball, and I look for a, an R, which uh, splits this leftmost left -most bin. Uh, and since this bin can maybe contain one, two, three, four, very few um, code words, very few balls, uh, all I all I can guarantee is that I will be able to move one-eighth of them, some fr constant fraction of them, to the right. Good. So now what it means is that every log n steps, O of log n steps, I'm able to move the leftmost uh, black uh, bin one position to the right. So after n steps, the leftmost black bin will be at most will have a weight at least n over log n. So these are the unmarked balls. I'm very happy with them. What about the marked balls? The marked balls, every log n steps, I was able to shift them by one position. So again, after n over after n steps, the marked ball, which is most to the most left, will also be in position at least n over log n. So I get my, uh, so I get my uh, minimum distance guarantee. What about the, uh, the weight distribution for the fellows with, of higher i? Well, these are the marked balls. In each step, I mark a, a polynomial number of uh, balls, say 2 times n squared times n. And I have at most n steps, so this is polynomial in n. And here, the error that I get, instead of doing one-third, two-thirds, instead of doing that, I'm doing something smaller, uh, accumulates, instead of doing one-half, accumulates to this value. <coughs> and that's how I uh, guarantee my bound. OK, good. Uh, let me finish with uh, uh, two open problems. Open, the first open problem I want to describe is our construction requires the decoder to listen to the beginning of the conversation. What happens if we have a situation in which the decoder starts listening in the middle of the transmission? That would mean that our, what the decoder is doing is he's not looking at the initial part of the matrix. He's only listening to what's happening at some contiguous part of the <coughs> matrix. How can I construct a matrix such that every contiguous n rows induces a weight distribution, which is uh, of the sort that we need? We don't know how to do that. Okay. Are you sure it's even possible? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there's some, some lower bound. I don't know. So, but uh, even if it's not possible to achieve capacity, what is it? What's possible? No, yeah. of course it won't be systematic, yeah. right? <laughs> That's, yeah, you, you can't have uh, both. Uh, That's what you started with over here. Yeah, this was our our, our initial initialization. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first problem. The second uh, open problem, which um, I, it's more in progress than uh, open is how to extend this uh, construction 
to other uh, binary, uh, memoryless, symmetric channels. Okay. The idea here is to um, uh, employ the external properties of the binary erasure channel and the binary symmetric channel with respect to these concatenated codes. So it seems that the worst you could do to this uh, code is for the inner code to introduce a binary symmetric channel, given that the capacity is fixed. And uh, the worst that you could do for the outer code is to erase symbols. So it seems that uh, from an external, ex external point of view, uh, it is possible to prove that uh, this construction works for any BMS uh, channel. But if it works for BSC, it works for any channel. That's not. I'm not familiar with such a theorem, but. Uh, but in, um, uh, Aaron has a blow in his feet. You get an extra fact of n in the air probability or something. Which is nothing in our terms. Of whom? Who's the person? Okay. Thanks. But he's here because he Okay. Thanks for the remark. You should get hold of him out. Okay, so thanks for taking the speaker.